So Revelation 21, and, and as we um, look at this chapter, in this chapter we see that the history of time is finished, and the history of eternity is about to begin. Now this gets into some exciting things, because think about that here now today with me. When we move into the eternal state following the millennium. We talked about the millennium last week. If you weren't here with us, go ahead and, and, and check out that, that uh, study on our website. And as we looked at the millennium, we understood that there are those in the millennium, that thousand year reign of Christ that's happening physically on this planet earth. It's going to be renewed, no doubt about it, but there's going to be people in their glorified bodies like us, all right? We're going to be reigning with Christ, but there's also going to be people that have survived through the tribulation, believers in Christ, and they're brought into the, into the millennial reign of Christ in their physical earthly bodies, and they're going to continue to have children, and so the earth is going to be greatly repopulated. But you see, we're still operating upon this measure of time during the millennium, but after the millennium, we're going to move into our eternal state that we're going to look at here in Revelation 21, and we're going to be outside of time. I can, I can barely comprehend that. I can say it, but what does that look like? What does that mean? I don't know, but we're going to be outside of time, and I think that's kind of cool. We're no longer going to be hampered by that time-space continuum. Nobody's going to be late for appointments. How about that? You're not going to be driving in your car going, oh man, I can't believe I'm running late. Oh my goodness, I shouldn't have stopped for that Starbucks. But, ah, and you're panicking. We're not going to be operating on time any longer. Nobody's going to be late any longer. I love that. But now we think of time on that linear line in a sense. It just This linear line of time that just goes on and on and on, doesn't it? That's how we think of time. But in heaven, there's not even any line any longer. In heaven, there's no time. We're outside of time. Time won't exist anymore. We're, we won't, you know, be struggling with those things any longer. We're just going to be enjoying the presence of God. So understand that as we talk about heaven, as we talk about the eternal state, oftentimes what, what do people think? Like, what is that going to, aren't I going to get bored? Aren't I going to be looking at my watch? Like just going, man, it's been 5,000 years and we're just kind of doing the same thing. You're not going to have watches anymore. You're not going to have calendars. You're not going to be worried about time because it's not going to exist. We're going to be outside of time. There's not going to be any measure of, of length or longevity in a sense. We're just going to be in this state enjoying the presence of God. It's going to be good, guys. Now, any Star Trek Fancy or any Trekkies here? Okay, a few of you, all right? So you know like the original, I don't, I don't even know if the new ones do, but the original series would always begin their episode, Space, The Final Frontier, right? Well, Revelation 21 is actually the final frontier for us, all right? This is it, the final frontier, because this is the eternal state, and we're going to do our best to unpack the description of what heaven and eternity is going to be like here today. Now, I love what John Corson says says the church is to be a hospital where people can come and be healed. No doubt about it. Jesus, our great physician. The church is to be a school where people can study to show themselves approved unto God. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. And the church is to be a gymnasium where people are working out their salvation. Philippians 2.12. It's also a place, again, a gymnasium where we are exercising ourselves unto godliness. 1 Timothy 4.7. But not only is the church to be a hospital, to be a school to be a gymnasium. The church is also to be a travel agency where we book people on that eternal excursion to heaven. Listen, chapter 21 is that travel brochure for us in a sense, all right? Revelation 21 is going to be us now looking at our destination, getting excited for the trip that we're on. You guys excited? You guys ready? Okay. First one. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So right away, we're, we're given this idea, this context, this, this understanding that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. All right? You can see I've entitled this message, All Things New. That's exactly what it's going to be, all things new. Now, that word new speaks here of something that's, that's fresh, 
and it's new in character. It doesn't speak of newness in time, like as though it's the most recent. Like, you know, when we get maybe a new car, you know, um, it's a new car in a sense to us because it's new to us. It's the most recent thing that we've got, but it's still just a car. There's nothing new about it in the sense of what it does and what it is. It's, an, it's a new car. Or you can say, oh, I got a new house. All right. And the house could be 100 years old. Doesn't mean it's new, but it's new to us. But this idea now isn't speaking about newness in that kind of way. This is speaking about something that's new in the way that it is completely outside of anything that we've seen before. It's fresh. It's new in character. This is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. It's going to be new in every way for us. Now, we were introduced to the reality of that in chapter 20 last week. Because at the end of chapter 20, we saw the, the end of the, the millennial reign of Christ. And at the end of the millennium was the great white throne judgment. Now, re- remember there what we saw. Um, look at verse 11 of chapter 20. All right. Because there we read, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, who, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. Here's the Lord God sitting on the throne, and at his very appearance and his gaze, it says that the the heaven and the earth fled away. Think about that. It's gone at this point. All that's sitting and existing here at the great white throne judgment would seem to be God and the people who are being judged, right? What did that look like? Was everything just kind of suspended in space? We're not sure exactly, but it certainly reminds us, doesn't it, that we have nothing apart from God. And one day we're going to stand exposed to realize that all that we have is the Lord. All that we needed was the Lord. Everything else is just going to be kind of poof, banished away. So it goes to show again that it matters what we're living for today. If you're putting your trust in things or even in yourself, there's going to be nothing to stand upon except for Jesus Christ in that day. Now, the idea here of heaven and earth passing away is is a popular understanding that we've seen through the Bible and even in the Old Testament. Let me read a few verses here. Uh, Psalm 102, verse 25 to 28. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. The children of your servants will continue, and their descendants will be established before you. And then in Isaiah 65, verse 17, 19, this is a a great passage. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice for ever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. So right even from the Old Testament prophets and writers, we get this concept, this idea that they had that heaven and earth would eventually be new again. That they would, the old would perish and a new would be brought in. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. And Peter writes about the same event taking place in 2 Peter 3, verse 10 to 13. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which, notices the heavens will pass away with, great, with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for, notice this, we look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's great. So Peter understood this idea. Oh, listen, heaven and earth is going to pass away. God's judgment is going to come, and these things are going to be rolled back. They're going to be gone. But we look for a new heaven and a new earth. Peter writes about that. We see that here now unfolding in Revelation 21. Now, the New York Times once reported on this dark, unseen energy permeating space that's pushing the universe apart, they claim. The origin of this energy remains a mystery. 
Now, Einstein predicted such a force in 1917. The Hubble Space Telescope, in striking new measurements of exploding stars, is confirming his calculations. Einstein is supposed to have called the force the cosmological constant. In a prediction that, that he later called his greatest blunder, Einstein posited a kind of anti-gravity energy that was pushing galaxies apart with a strength that had not changed in cosmic history. Now, scientists who seek to explain that phenomena suggest that it may become stronger or weaker over time, either violently tearing the universe apart or quietly just shutting down. If it somehow ceased, gravity would again predominate and the universe would collapse upon itself, they claimed. Now, scientists are always trying to figure out the details and the, the composition of our vast universe, aren't they? And they're trying to make sense of it all, but all they need to do is hold on to the one who's holding it all together already. You can't explain away the universe without understanding there's a God and a designer behind all of it. Notice what Colossians 1 verse 16 to 17 says, all things were created through him and for him, and he's before all things, and in him all things consist. That idea of all things consist means that he's holding it all together. Everything is held together by him. And so in a moment, the Lord has every ability to just kind of let it go. That's a popular song right now, isn't it? But he can just let that go. And, and the universe, the heavens and the earth can just be gone and done away with. Because God is the one that's holding it all together. This is not, not something where scientists are going, well, you know, these things are, 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 are just possibly going to happen this way. God is going to one day cause the heaven and the earth to just vanish. And the word tells us so, very clearly. But with that, will come in a new heaven and a new earth. And we're not talking about just a little renovation here, guys. Understand that. That's what I want you to kind of grasp here today when we talk about a new heaven and new earth. God's not talking about a little renovation here. This is a total recreation. Now, I like what God said. Um, or like I said, God isn't just going to do a little rearranging with the elements that are already there. God's going to do a completely new thing. Isaiah 65 verse 17, we already read that. But it said there that he creates new heavens and a new earth. And that Hebrew word for create is the word bara in Hebrew, which means to create out of nothing. This is what God did in the beginning, and it's what he's going to do at the end again. He's going to create something out of nothing, a new heaven and a new earth. This is not a refashioning, a retweaking, a retooling of what's presently there now. It's going to be a recreation, a new thing, you see. I love that, creating out of nothing. So understand the new heaven, new earth, this new creation is going to be unlike anything that you've ever seen before. You ever, you know, hear people say, oh, man, I've, I've seen it all before. You can't pull anything new over on me. I've seen it all before. Listen, there's coming something that no eye has seen, and it's going to be exciting, and it's going to be glorious. Remember, Paul was caught up to heaven, and he records that he heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 4. He was caught up. He saw things that he says, oh, I... I I can't even describe, not just what he saw. He said, I can't describe what I, what I heard. Inexpressible words. Think about that. Heaven is going to be so new that we'll see things never seen before, hear things never heard before. We're going to probably smell things we've never smelled before. It's going to be a beautiful place. Think about that. Nobody's going to be, you know, breaking wind in, in heaven. It's going to be, that's a part of the curse. That's, that's not going to happen. Think about that. I, understand that, guys. Seriously. Nobody in heaven's going to be sitting there going, really? Okay, who did that? Come on. It's like not going to happen. That's a part of the curse, and that's going to be gone. I'm sorry. My, my sometimes juvenile mind goes there. I understand that. But listen, I was rocked when that kind of process, I just processed that for the first time this week as I was looking through that. I'm going, that's going to be good. You don't know my family, guys, and what I have to put up with. So <laughs> listen. And that blew my mind. I was like, I'm really excited about heaven again now. Not that I wasn't before, but I'm like, it's going to be so perfect. It's going to be so perfect. Forgive me on that, but I, I just had to share that with you because it really got me excited about heaven. But we're going to see things that we've never seen. Things are going to, and, and it's interesting that John kind of does that himself. He talks about heaven, not just about what he 
sees, but he also talks about things that he didn't see, things that aren't going to be there, like breaking wind. That's not going to be there. But he also talks about, John, here in Revelation, things that aren't going to be there. What does he say next? He says, I saw no more sea. There's no more sea. Now, that seems kind of peculiar. For many, the sea is a wonderful place, isn't it? Walks along the beach, you know, sunsets, fishing, surfing. We oftentimes like the sea, yet for the Jewish mind, the sea was a place of turmoil and, and often pictured a place of evil in the Bible. Look at what Isaiah 27, 1 says, In that day the Lord, with a severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. Isaiah 57, 20, but the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. We've also seen in our study through Revelation, what happened in chapter 13, I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. It's the Antichrist, he comes out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, on his heads a blasphemous name. So the sea was oftentimes a picture of something that was very much in chaos or stirred wickedness and evil. Perhaps John includes this to mean that there's no longer going to be any upheaval or chaos any longer in heaven. It's going to be a place of perfect peace. Now we know that water is going to be present in heaven because chapter 22 talks about the river of life that's going to be flowing with water there in eternity. So we know there's going to be water. So this idea of no longer having any sea could mean that there's no longer this stirring up of trouble and chaos. But what else do seas do? It separates us, doesn't it? About 70% of the earth's surface is covered in water. And so the seas become a great divide. Remember, John is writing this letter, writing this book on the island of Patmos. He's looking out and all he sees is the sea, right? And it's a hindrance to him. It's a block to him. It's a barrier for him. But when the water is gone, the seas are gone as he sees in heaven. There's going to be no longer anything that separates. Is that good? It's comforting, isn't it? No longer is anything going to separate us from one another, most importantly, from our heavenly Father. And so continuing on in verse 2, John saw this holy city now, New Jerusalem, being brought down. This is going to be our place of habitation now for all of eternity. Oh, I don't show that. Some wonder, is this going to be some kind of you know, spherical thing that's just going to be kind of hovering there. You know, it, it's going to be cool, but this holy city is going to be brought down. And it's, it's called New Jerusalem, not because it's going to be like earthy Jerusalem in a sense that it's going to be, you know, a, a replica of Jerusalem, but it's going to be having that connection to it, you see. Now, it was on earthy Jerusalem that our redemption was paid, wasn't it? Where Jesus hung on a cross for us. This is a special city. It's a holy city. I mean, how many, how many holy cities can you name today? Because typically within cities, we see that, you know, it, it simply equals crime and, and sin. The very question, holy city, almost seems to contradict itself because we don't see it a lot. It's, it's where people gravitate to in the city to carry out, you know, kind of the, the seedy stuff of life. But here, this is a holy city. It's not a place that man can create. It comes down from heaven, and its origin is from God. And it's beautiful beyond words. It's, it's seen as a bride adorned for her husband. This holy city coming down is seen as his bride that's adorned for her husband. Whenever you go to a wedding, what do people always ask, you know? Oh, how does the bride look? Everybody's fasting with the bride. Everybody wants to see what, and nobody cares about the groom. It's kind of like, we don't care. You can be, you know, in, in shorts and whatever, but it's the bride that we're focused on, right? So the city is going to be fitted and, and adorned as a bride for her husband. And this is the city that the Old Testament saints were waiting for. Think about that. Because the Old Testament saints all died without yet receiving the promise, right? The promise they were holding on to waiting for, you know, their redemption in a sense through Jesus Christ. They had a, a faith in that, but they hadn't yet 
received it. And so they were living their life waiting for that future city of God. Look at what Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 to 10 says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out into the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. This is that city now coming down here in Revelation 21. This is our destination, guys. Our our passports, our visas, they're going to be done away with. We're going to be citizens now of the new Jerusalem. Paul wrote in Philippians 3, verse 20 to 21, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. And that's exactly what he's going to do. He's going to prepare a city for us, his bride, and we are going to be citizens of that city where he is going to subdue all things now to himself. It's going to be glorious. Awesome. And look at verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Wow. Notice John hears now a loud voice from heaven. A a commanding voice from heaven. This must be something important that is about to get dropped right now. A loud voice from heaven. And what does it say? Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them and, and they shall be his people. As we read here, we find that this is indeed a glorious announcement. Guys, maybe one of the most glorious announcements that we can ever hear. Because God now is going to dwell with men directly with men. Listen, if you catch anything today from this message, I hope you catch this fact right here. That God's desire has always been to have direct fellowship with his creation, with us, with men. Not, and, and you know what I mean by that. Human humanity, right? Okay? In case you ladies are going, huh, that pastor needs to change his attitude here. No. It's humanity, right? God's desire and his goal has always been to have direct fellowship with men. Think about that. If you, if you don't catch anything else from this message today, and I hope you do, but catch this. Go home with this understanding here. Because as great as heaven is going to be, and it's going to be great because there's the absence of sin, it'll be yet greater because of the presence of God dwelling with men. As great as heaven is going to be because there's no longer any sin, no longer any curse, no longer any death, no longer any mourning or sadness. As great as those things are, heaven is going to be great because God's presence is going to be experienced in all of us. We're going to dwell with God. It doesn't get any better than that, guys. And like I say, that's always been God's desire. In the garden, God walked among Adam and Eve, and he enjoyed fellowship with them. What happened? Sin, we know the story, sin came in. And sin came in and marred this, it wrecked this beautiful fellowship that God had desired with his creation. Sin got in the way, and it separated us from God. And sin has been in the way of that fellowship with God ever since. Genesis 3, verse 8 says this, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. They hid because they were guilty. They were feeling shame because of their sin. Remember, they, they tried to clothe themselves, right? They tried to clothe themselves in, 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 in leaves and stuff, fig leaves that were not comfortable. God had to provide animal skin for them. Where did the animal skin come from? A sacrifice. This started the, the picture now of what God was going to do to bring man into right relationship with him. And in Exodus we read how God provided a, a representation of his dwelling place through the tabernacle. In the Holy of Holies where only the high priest could go in one day of year sat the Ark of the Covenant where 
it says his presence dwelt. It's lit of that Ark of the Covenant. It was called the mercy seat. It was there God says, I will, I will meet with you. It would be based upon his mercy. It would be based upon the mercy and the grace of God by which we could ever approach him. You see? Sacrifices were made. The blood from those sacrifices would be sprinkled upon that place. Again, all picturing that final work that Jesus would do. And so the fullest representation of God's desire to fellowship with man came in the person of Jesus Christ. John 1.14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That word dwelt, as you may know, means to tabernacle. Jesus dwelt among us. Or the word became flesh and dwelt among us in Jesus Christ. He tabernacled among us to reveal our heavenly father. Like I said, this is what God has always desired, to be in direct fellowship with man. And it won't be, though, until this eternal state that it'll be experienced in its fullness, guys. Oh, we get a taste of that now, no doubt about it. Paul writes how we see, you know, but as through a mirror dimly, right? We are seeing a, a, a glimpse of what is awaiting us. But we're not going to experience that fullness of the presence of God and experience him dwelling among us in its entirety and fullness until we're with him in that eternal state, until this corruption puts on incorruption and this mortality puts on immortality. And it's here that God is going to dwell among men what he has always desired, what he has provided a, a provision to experience in part. But there's coming a day when it's going to be shown in its fullness. We'll be with God. He will dwell with us and us with him. Hallelujah for that, guys. God wants to be in fellowship with you. Can you believe it? Does that just blow your mind today? That God wants to be in fellowship with you. This is going to be the greatest thing about heaven. It's not the streets of gold or all the splendor, but simply being with God, being before him without hindrances or obstacles. That's the greatest glory of heaven, the ultimate restoration of what was lost in the fall. Listen to what Spurgeon says. I do not think the, the glory of Eden lay in its grassy walks or in the boughs bending with luscious fruit, but its glory lay in this, that the Lord God walked in the garden in the cool of the day. Here was Adam's highest privilege, that he had companionship with the most high. He had companionship with the most high. And God has been in the process for thousands of years of restoring that. He's provided that restoration of fellowship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. And we experience fellowship with him today. But one day, we shall be before him. And we shall be made like him. And we will have complete and direct fellowship with God. And you ever ask yourselves, why does God want to be in a relationship with us? What does he get out of the deal? Why would he do this? Does he know who I am? Right? I mean, we can struggle on that idea. Why would God want to be in a relationship with me? We don't have a lot to offer, do we? But understand this, guys, that God is love. And love needs to have an object to display that love to. We become that object by which he gets to demonstrate his love to and his love upon. It's not unlike us having kids, right? Why do we do it? Is it to get chores done, to make money? No, the opposite is true. They take our money. They make our house more messy where we have to do more chores. We don't get a lot out of the deal at first. We have to change dirty diapers when they're young. It's kind of like, why did I? We could kind of go there at first, right? We can struggle with that, but listen. I love my kids. Love you, buttercup. <clears throat> But why do we put ourselves through that? Because it's an opportunity for us to display our love and grow in fellowship with someone that we instinctually care for and desire to demonstrate our, our love and our heart to them and grow in intimacy and fellowship with them. We get to do it because, not because I'm going, oh, I gotta have more kids because, you know, this is going to really be beneficial for me, you know? Better tax breaks and they're gonna you know, help paint my house when I need it done. You know, it's not for those things. It's so that I can just love upon these guys and, and share the love of God with them. And yet, that's exactly what God is doing. 
I want to be in fellowship with you so that I can demonstrate my love to you. So I can show my glory to another. And we do nothing to earn that. Understand. We do nothing to, to inherit that in, in and of ourselves. It's what God desires to do by his grace for us. So we'll be with God. And he will lovingly and compassionately and tenderly be caring for us. Notice what we read there. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Wipe away every tear from their eyes. The idea that he will wipe away every tear doesn't necessarily mean that there will be tears in heaven. Maybe we'll have tears of joy. Maybe they're tears of gratitude as we walk with Jesus and just thanking him for his great sacrifice. I don't know how I'll be able to hold back tears when I just see him and I thank him for what he's gone through to save me and to usher me into this eternal state. Some have wondered, how will I deal with the thought of a loved one not being here? Am I going to be weeping over that? Will that bring tears? But remember, again, as we have looked at Isaiah 65 even a couple of times this morning, the former things have passed away. Isaiah 65, 17 says, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. They won't even be remembered or come to mind. So more than likely, it's simply a way of saying that there just won't be any tears in heaven. God's going to take care of that. McDonald, W. McDonald, the commentator, said, the expression, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, does not mean that there will be tears in heaven. It's a poetic way of saying that there won't be tears in heaven. It's one way to look at it. We're not sure how we're going to, what emotions we're going to have when we're in heaven, in our glorified body, what we're going to be feeling and thinking. As Isaiah says, the former things will not even be remembered or come to mind. So if we're going to be just so completely fixed on Jesus that we're going to be in this incredible blissful reality look at verse 5 here then he who sat on the throne said behold I make all things new and he said to me right for these words are true and faithful so this here I make all things new this is written in the present tense in other words it's as though it's saying I am making all things new see heaven is that great turnaround all things will be new there are those who think everything is going to go back to that state that they were in the Garden of Eden. And we can kind of fantasize about that as though it was a place of perfection. We already talked about that Spurgeon quote where, you know, the, the, the greatest privilege for Adam was that he walked in, in fellowship with God. And we can go, oh boy, it's going to be restored to that Garden of Eden. It's going to be great. And we can fantasize about those things. Listen to what David Guzik says. I think he says this so well. Our instinct is to romantically consider innocence as man's perfect state. And wish Adam would have never done what he did. But we fail to realize that redeemed man is greater than innocent man. That we gain more in Jesus than we ever lost in Adam. God's perfect state is one of redemption, not innocence. And there's a new creation that goes along with it for us to fully understand and comprehend the redemption that we have had in Christ. That he has truly made all things new. We come to Christ and we are a new creation in him. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And he's continuing out that process, working out that redemptive plan even now in our lives. And he's going to bring it through to fruition. He is making all things new as this verse is written in the present tense. I'm making all things new. I'm continuing to do that new work in you and I will see it through. Philippians 1, 6 as being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's what the Lord Jesus is doing in our lives. And I like this. As, as John is comprehending all these things, I'm sure he's just kind of getting caught up. It's as though the Lord has to say, hey, John, hey, Write these things down, right? Write, for these words are true and faithful. Get writing. And John's probably put the, the pen down. He's like, oh, man, this is so overwhelming. I was like, John, let's keep going here. There's more to write. Write these things down. They're true and faithful. You can depend on these things, guys. What we are reading here is not fantasy. This is not man's word. This is God's word for us to encourage us that he has something great in store for all of us. He has something great in store, and we can hold on to this. Depend this is not something where it's wishful thinking. Not us going, well, you know, I've 
read about some of these eternal things, and boy, I sure hope it's the way it is. God's saying, John, write it down. These things are true and faithful. These are dependable things that I am sharing with you. This is exactly how it's going to go down. We can trust in this here. And so in verse 6, he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. At this stage of eternity now, the words will be said, it is done. When we see that all that God has prepared for us and has established for us now, nobody, none of us are going to be able to, nobody's going to look around and go, well, you know, it's pretty cool. What about adding another little something over here? Maybe a nice park, you know, or another wing on my mansion. How about we just kind of, nobody's going to be looking at the stuff and going, ah, you know, it's, it's not bad. It's going to be done. It's going to be complete. And we are going to be completely satisfied in all that he has prepared. This is going to be more than we have ever imagined because no eye can even comprehend what he has in store for us, you see. This is going to be well beyond our realm of, of imagining how good it can be. We're going to get there. We're going to see this heaven, this, this new Jerusalem dropping down. We're going to see our new digs, and we're going to be like, oh, God, this I could not have even thought it would be this great. We're going to be able to say, it is, it is done. Lord, you've done a good work here. It is done indeed. And Jesus will give the fountain of the water of life freely, it tells us there in verse 6. Now that kind of gets lost on us a bit in in our day, doesn't it? When, you know, you can just kind of turn on the tap in the kitchen or in the bathroom and water just runs freely. We kind of take it for granted. But in the ancient world, water was life for them. Water was a key resource. Because being an agrarian society, water was of utmost necessity. Life would then, you know, it would revolve around the well, right? You come to the well, you draw your water, you see, boy, I need water to feed my animals, to water my my crops, this is important. If anybody came across a fountain, that was a luxury. That was something that was like striking gold because now you didn't have to work for that water. That water just poured out and you're able to receive from that water on a continuous flow. This was something that was incredible. So when, a, when, when the people of this day would hear a claim like this, that I will give her the fountain of the water of life freely, people perked up. They're like, whoa, I like the sounds of that. That sounds good to me. I like that. This got their attention, you see. But I hope it gets your attention today as well, all right? Don't miss this here. Because you see, every one of us has a thirst that needs quenching. Every man is born with a, a physical thirst, just as everyone else has a spiritual thirst. We know that we need to take water in, or else we're not going to survive. We're not going to keep going. We need to take water in regularly. There's a physical need, but there's also a spiritual need that every man has. And you're going to, people are going to try to find something to quench that spiritual thirst that they have. They don't realize what, what it is. What, what is it they're what is it I'm craving? They're, they're longing for something, but there's a spiritual thirst that every person has. And the only solution that is going to be lasting is to allow Jesus to quench that thirst for you. And that comes by surrendering your life to him and worshiping him. It's the only thing that will satisfy. Because that's part of your human makeup, isn't it? You were designed to be worshipers of God. And until you are fulfilling that purpose, there's going to be a, a, a spiritual void, in a sense, a thirst that's taking place in your life. And people are trying to fill that with all certain things because they don't understand what it is. They try through other relationships. They try through, through maybe drinking or, or drugs and, and all the different means that the world is trying to present to say this is what's going to satisfy. But it's wrapped up. It's found only in and through Jesus Christ. And he gives this great invitation. Well, it's not even an invitation. It's just kind of here's the reality. In this day, in this eternal state, I'm going to give her this fountain of life, of of water of life freely. This is going to continue to pour out. But that invitation has been given throughout the word. Look at what he said in John 7, verse 37. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. John 4, 14. Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. 
Isaiah 55, 1. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. The invitation has been given. Are you thirsty today? Are you thirsty today? That's, that's one of the requirements to get into heaven. That you, need to, you need to be thirsty. You need to understand that there is a thirst that needs to be quenched. That can only be quenched in Jesus Christ. And you say, yeah, Jesus, take that thirst away from me. Fill me with that water of life freely. That's one of the requirements to get to heaven. And Jesus will provide us with all that we need. When we're in this eternal state, it's all going to be wrapped up in him. We're going to be completely satisfied. And he wants you to know that satisfaction in him now, today, guys. I don't know where you're at, but maybe some of you are sitting here today going, yeah, you know what? I've kind of been thirsty for something. I don't know what it is. I don't know what. I, I've tried different things in my life, but I never, ever seem like I'm satisfied. And the problem is you won't be through the things of this world. By what you're trying to fill your life with, you won't be satisfied until you give your life over to the one that gave you life, Jesus Christ, who wants to come in and fill you with that very uh, thing that you are needing. That he wants to take away and quench that very thirst that every person has, you see. And understand, guys, this is so good. So important. Because what, is, what does he say? We'll give of the fountain of the water of life freely. Freely. That very word means undeservedly. It's, it's without cause. In other words, you, you can't buy this. You can't buy You know many people are trying to buy this life by living a good life? They're trying to buy entrance to heaven by doing good things. Oh, if I'm a good person, if I do charitable acts, then yeah, I'm going to make it to heaven. They're trying to earn their way. And you can never earn your way because you can never pay a high enough price for what God saw needed to be done to bring about forgiveness of sin. Jesus had to come and give his life, a perfect life, and die in our place that we could be forgiven of sin. So that now we can partake of this free gift of salvation freely, undeservedly, that we can take of this water of life without cause. We didn't do anything to earn it or to, or, or to achieve it. God doesn't look at you and say, well, I guess I better save him since, I mean, he's doing all these nice things right now. I guess I have to save him. I guess I better prepare a place in heaven for him because he's living such a good life. God doesn't do that. He doesn't work on that basis. There was no cause at work that gained us this favor. It's all by the grace of God, undeservedly. Grace is simply getting that which we don't deserve. We didn't deserve to be saved. We didn't deserve to have Jesus pay the penalty for our sin. But he did it by grace. And it's by grace we receive that. Simply say, yeah, I'm thirsty, Jesus. Quench that thirst for me today. Fill that inner need that I have. Come in and replace my life with your life, Jesus. That's what was able to be done through that work on the cross. A great exchange took place. He took your worst and replaced it with his best. He took your sin and replaced it with his righteousness so that we could have a right standing before our heavenly father. That we could one day now enjoy his awesome presence in heaven and fellowship with him. Well, let's wrap up here. We end in verse 7 and 8. We see two groups that are being mentioned here. Let's read that. Verse 7 says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So two groups are mentioned here. Those that have overcome and those that were overcome. Now, at this point, these people have already been placed in the lake of fire. At the close of the millennium, remember we saw at the end of chapter 20, the great white throne judgment. It's repeated here for us to, re to remind us that heaven is only occupied with the heavenly. Heaven is only occupied with the heavenly. 
Guess what, guys? We're going to have no bad neighbors in heaven, all right? She glad for that? Aren't you excited for that? There'll be no bad neighbors. We're not going to be annoyed or bothered by anybody in heaven. So the question needs to be asked, how do we become heavenly citizens? Because though this list of those that were overcome sounds like the worst of the earth, I understand there's not a lot that separates me from them. There's not a lot that separates you from them. See, I'm not going to heaven because I live better than these people. No, the one thing that will separate me from these people that have their place in the lake of fire is that I'm in Jesus. I put on Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Those that are heavenly citizens are those that have put on Jesus Christ as their means for salvation. They put on the Lord Jesus Christ. These other groups of people that we read there in verse 8 are those that have denied Jesus Christ and his work for them. They've rejected Jesus Christ. They said, no, we're going to go about this on our own. We're going to do our own thing. They've rebelled. They've rejected Jesus Christ. And they've now become overcome by sin. They take part here in the second death. We talked about that last week. But remember the saying, if you're born twice, you die once. If you're born once, you die twice. You see, every person is going to be born once physically. But if you're never born again in Jesus Christ, well, you're going to die a physical death. But at the great white throne judgment, you're going to be resurrected to stand before God again. Where you're pronounced with that guilt for rejecting Jesus. And you're going to die an eternal death. You're going to be placed in the lake of fire. That was prepared for Satan and his demons. God doesn't send people to hell. People choose to go to hell by rejecting Jesus Christ. So these people experience the second death. Again, guys, overcoming is not a works-based thing. It's a faith thing. Look at what, what John writes in 1 John 5, verse 4 to 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what brings us into heaven. That's what saves us from our sin. That's what causes us to be overcomers because we have put our trust and our faith and believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the means for our salvation. That's what causes us to be overcomers, guys. Not a lot that separates me from these people. But it's simply Jesus Christ that separates us. Faith in him. And so this is written to show us that heaven is going to be absolutely perfect. No sin. No bad neighbors. No wickedness. It's going to be done away with, you see. And along with this victory comes riches and relationship. Notice it says that we inherit all things. All that God is and all that God has is going to be ours. We're going to be inheriting all things. But again, the greatest thing that we inherit is this Direct fellowship, relationship with God. Walking with God in heaven. Wow. It's going to be incredible. And it all comes so easily by simply putting our trust in Jesus. I can't, I can't hammer that home enough. I was talking with somebody earlier this morning, and it's funny how so many people can have all the right answers. And they can all be, yeah, I believe this. Oh, I believe the Bible. Oh, I believe Jesus, no doubt. But when it comes down to why are you going to heaven, so many times people revert back to, well, you know, because I, I'm living a good life. I'm, 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 I'm being a good person. And so many times people revert back to that. And they fail to miss that, or they fail to understand that it's only through the, the grace of God that I go. It's only through my Trust in Jesus and the work he did for me on the cross to forgive me, to wash me clean, to make me a new creation. I can't do that. Only God can do that. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, eternity is going to be great. Not only will we be in the the first heavens, during the tribulation, but we come back to this earth and reign with Christ for a thousand years. 
After that thousand years, the earth and the heavens vanish away. And a new heaven, a new earth is created. We're going to be outside of time. We're not going to be bored, guys. We're going to be enjoying an incredible eternity with our Heavenly Father. Oh, I can't wait. It is going to be good. Let me close with this. Look at what Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, verse 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away. It's reserved in heaven for you. And you are being kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for all that you have reserved for us. We are excited, Lord, for what you have in store. May we live lives of expectancy, anticipation as I've often prayed. Getting ready, Lord, to be with you face to face. May we be watching. May we be ready. But Lord, in the meantime, may we be carrying out your will and your work here around us because there are those that are perishing all around us, Lord. May we have a heart for these people. Lord, may we not be calloused and say, well, I'm saved and so I'm ready. May we have a heart that says, I don't want anybody to perish. That's not God's heart. It's not what God has planned. He's provided the means for them to be saved. So Lord, give us a heart that beats for the lost. To share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. The good news that you have done the work to save them. And all they need to do is turn from sin, repent, and and turn to you in faith. It's simple. So may we do that, Lord. Lead us on from here, we ask in your name, Jesus. Amen.